everyone. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. And today I'm sitting down with New York Times bestselling author, Rachel Hollis. Her new book, Girls Stop Apologizing, challenges women everywhere to stop talking themselves out of their dreams and to adopt a shame-free attitude to achieving their goals. Please help me welcome Rachel Hollis. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I got to read the book and there's so much fun, good, tangible advice. So thank you. I know what my gift to all my friends is going to be this year. This is so sweet. Thank yeah. I, I mean, it really, that. it's it's one of those things where it's just nice to be reminded of things that maybe or should seem like no brainers, but a lot of the times women don't give themselves permission to feel this way. Absolutely. I don't think that anything I'm ever talking about is new information, but I do believe that sometimes we have to hear something 10 different ways before it finally sticks and you have that moment where you're like, oh, okay, fine, I'll stop eating Cheetos. Like you need, you need the reminder. And so I just wanted to talk about the things that had been really helpful in my life and my career to get me to where I am today. I just eat less Cheetos. Yes, just yeah, that's fewer that Cheetos, fine. but yeah. I still, I mean, the puffs, I have to. <laughs> um, so your your last book was called Girl, Wash Your Face. Mm -hmm. So how is this one different, or how does it sort of build upon that message? So, so many women who had read Girl, Wash Your Face, the, the follow-up question they had was, um, how? So Girl, Wash Your Face is all about taking ownership of your life. Like these are the things that you've believed and they're hurting you, and so take ownership and move forward. And so many women were like, great, I'm in. What do I do? How do you actually move forward? How do you pursue a goal? How do you try and get a new job? How do you pay off your debt? And as I started to marinate in that question, I realized that everything that I've achieved in my life, whether it was, um, you know, uh, professionally, like building a company or personally, like running a marathon, I achieved it in the same way. So I used the same steps and I thought, well, dang, if I could teach those steps, it might be helpful to other women when they are unsure of how to move forward. Definitely. You mentioned your businesses. Um, the Chic site is this really successful lifestyle brand. And yeah. it's interesting when you go from the book and then you look on your site, it really, they go hand in hand. And so many of the things you talk about on your site are in the book. So yeah. this is really kind of like just building upon what you're your viewers and your fans already love about. Yeah, I mean, it's ironic. I started, uh, I owned an event planning company in LA and then I became a food blogger. And so it's really funny that all these years later, like that was 2007, 2008, now look at us now. And people are like, man, how do those two things correlate? Like, how did you get from there to here? And the answer is that the brand really evolved as I evolved as a woman. So in 2008, I was trying to figure out how to, you know, be a wife and how to take care of my kids and now I'm focusing on personal development. How do you grow to the next level and how do you better show up for who it is that you want to be? So I just kept evolving and then I took the audience along for the ride. And you mentioned evolving and in the book you point out that a lot of women are conditioned to base their value on what they can do for other people. And you kind of talk about your evolution to now working more on personal development, but how do you make that switch? Because I would imagine it's really hard if you have a family. Well, I think the first step is recognizing why you do the things you do. So I've done a lot of therapy in my life and that was a big deal for me was understanding why do I believe what I believe? Uh, so for me, I think from the time I was little, and this is a lot of women I know, you're raised to be a good girl. So if you're a good girl for your parents, if you're a good sister, good granddaughter, you're all, your, your value is often based on how other people perceive you. And then you show up and you're a grown woman and you're still grappling with this idea that if you're not good based on what other people think that you're not doing well. Um, so I never hear, I've never once heard someone say like, oh, like, oh, look at Brittany. She is so great about self-care. She's such a good woman. It's usually based based on, oh, she's such a good wife for her husband, or she's such a good mom to her children. And that's twisted on a bunch of levels, because then it means that someone else gets to determine your worth. But also, what if you don't have children? What if you're single? What if you're not ever going to marry a man? So then what does that say? You don't have value because you don't fit into a certain kind of box. So I just wanted to talk about the whys. And maybe in me talking about the whys, you see something that you can recognize as a pattern in your own life so that it gives you the chance to go, oh, dang, I do fall into that trap. And just knowing is truly half the battle. Just knowing why will help you figure out how to get around it. 
And I think that's what makes the book so relatable is that you're giving this advice, but you're very much tying it to your own personal journey and your experiences. And one of those was, you know, you had children, but then you also started your event planning business and you loved it. And the kind of guilt you felt for doing something ambitious that you love that you were doing for yourself, which is something I've really never thought about because I don't have children. Like yeah. I'm so ambitious and that's yeah. something that defines me. And I've never thought about being ashamed of that. But then when people are expecting you to fit in this mom box, totally. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, I felt for many years, like there was something wrong with me. Like I, I really did feel shame in, I didn't want to be a stay at home mom. I love my kids, but, uh, and I so freaking respect stay at home moms is the hardest job in the whole world, but it just wasn't for me. And I really struggled with the shame of why am I not like other women? And it made me feel like I don't fit in. And then when I don't fit in, now I have a shame spiral and everything's wrong. And so I did what a lot of ambitious women like me do, which is I pursued my dreams, but I did it in the dark, meaning I pursued it, you know, at five a.m. before my husband woke up and I did it after the kids were in bed. I thought, well, I want to pursue this, this dream in my heart, but I'll do it in a way so long as it doesn't inconvenience anyone else. And I think a lot of women struggle with that, that we're like, oh, I'm going to pursue this goal, but I'm just going to do it in a way that doesn't bother anybody. And honestly, I don't think men do that. I don't think men are like, oh, I want to be this kind of man. Better make sure it's okay with my wife first. Um, so I just wanted to, to talk about that and what is this narrative and why do we buy into it? Because for me, I spent so many years living in shame and, and drowning in anxiety because I felt like I wasn't doing anything right. And when I started to take ownership of who I am, when I started to just confidently say like, hey, this is me. Some people are going to love me and some people are going to hate me, but it is worth it. It is worth having people misunderstand and not like you if it means that you get to live boldly and confidently as yourself. Do you think that living in your true self thing is something that women can learn to do sooner? Because I talk to a lot of women in their like 40s and they're like, yeah, I'm myself. But it, it's like your 20s and 30s, you're just trying to get to that place, really. I hope so. And, yeah. and to me, I feel like uh, I hope that we're bringing up the next generation. And I don't just mean like my daughter who's two. I hope by the time my daughter's you know, in her 20s, she doesn't even, she will watch this video and be like, what were they even talking about? Like, it's going to be so foreign to her. But even our middle schoolers and our high schoolers, just to raise them in a way that says, whoever you are mm -hmm. is great. You don't need to look like her. You don't need to be like that. You don't need to fit into this box. Just raising them with the confidence to be themselves. They're, they're wonderfully weird selves instead of trying to fit into a mold. Because not only is that incredible for kids to, to, to gain that confidence, but I also think that when you give children the autonomy to be who they are, they will give that to other people. And you will raise a generation of children that are respectful of everybody's innate, special, unique weirdness. And just being kind of less fearful to walk out into the world, you know, just being who you are. Have there been moments in your career, in your path that were really fearful? Can you t talk about one where you kind of had to overcome or maybe change your relationship with fear? Well. I mean, I'm living it right now. I'm living it right now. It's so funny. You know, nobody really cares about who you are, what you're, you're doing when you're this, like, tiny blogger. Maybe you've experienced this in your own career. When, when you're less known, nobody cares. And then, you know, Grandma used to say, new levels, new devils. Like, every time you sort of get to a new place and things expand, now that comes with a certain amount of haters or Internet trolls or people who are going to dislike what your message is or what you're saying. And I think... The last year has brought incredible success, and it's also brought a lot of negativity. And the question that I'm constantly asking myself is, like, are you strong enough to keep walking this path? Like, you, part of what I do is tell women that someone else's opinion is none of your business, and nobody else gets to tell you who to be. And so if I'm saying that to you, I, I feel like the universe was like, okay, 
you want to teach that, I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice that every single day in your life. And so for me, this last year has been a lot of fear because I have a company of people of 22 people who pay rent and their car payments and support their families because of the work that I do. And it is so scary to have that much responsibility. Like if I have a misstep, what does that do for all these people who are counting on me to be a leader of this company? So there's a lot of fear. And someone asked me recently, they were like, how do you live fearlessly? And I was like, oh my God, I do not live fearlessly. I'm afraid all the time. But there's this old quote, like courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being afraid and showing up anyway. So um, I'm scared often, but I still continue to show up because I'm trying to practice what I preach. Uh, the other thing I would say too is if you are struggling with something like that, I don't know if this will work for everybody, but for me personally, when I am feeling nervous or anxious or fearful or any of those things, if I can do something that makes me feel physically strong, it makes me feel mentally strong and emotionally braver. So I work out every single day of my life, even if it's for only 15 minutes. Um, but I do something every day. I'll like do push-ups. I'll actually physically push myself to do something with my body that feels hard because I'm like, oh, sis, you know, you did 50 push-ups this morning. Like this meanie on Instagram is nothing. Yeah. Uh, that takes me into the time management portion, which is a huge part of this. You can have goals and dreams, but if you're working a full-time job, you have to find another way to make it work. I love, I love how you said that hustle is your love language. Yes, it is. I, I love that, it. I thought that was really cool because it is something that you have to want and make happen. Absolutely. And so you give some really great tips in the book about time management. But I'm interested for you, like you have four children, you wrote this book. Tell Walk people through your day because I thought that was... Yeah, intense. I mean, yeah, really my day is intense, yeah. and I think to f to fit in all of these things and to show up the way I want to show up, not just for my family or or my staff, but for myself, I've got to be really intentional in how I plan out that day. So I get up every day at five a.m. Um, my morning routine is so important; it's sacred in my life. Um, having a slow cup of coffee, writing in my journal, starting with gratitude, um, that workout, the green smoothie, um, and then hit the ground running and. For me, I have a ton of travel in my life. Like I travel constantly. So I have to have routines and habits that I can take with me wherever I go. Like I can do the same thing this morning in New York that I do back home in Texas that I'll do tomorrow in Toronto. Because um, so often people think that they need a certain, they need like the perfect situation in order to show up as their best selves. Well, gosh, anybody can show up as their best selves in the right situation. The question is, can you show up as your best self even in hard times, even when you're exhausted, even when you're in a crappy hotel room in Iowa? Like, can you continue to be the person you want to be no matter what? And to me, the way you do that is through the habits that you don't ever let go of no matter where you are. Yeah. I would say I'm somebody who really rejected that for a long time, having a routine and a habit. And I would say in the last six months... I've been reading a little bit more, making my bed in the morning. Yes, have you watched that thing about? Yes, yes about making it's your like bed. It's like changed my life, yeah, and I don't deal. understand why, but I yeah. just keep doing. Yes, well, I feel like it's <laughs> that. I mean, if you have you all read the thing about making your bed, it's just this idea that um, it's a, and you could Google the video, but it's just this idea that. You've, you started the day accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. And no matter what else happens today, you made your bed. And even if today is awful, you can come home at the end of the day and you're like, oh, I made my bed. Right. So it's just, I, I think that if you own the morning, you own the day. Yeah. And if you own the day, you own the week and so on. So to me, if you can't do anything else, if you just start your day with intention, mm -hmm. it can change everything else that comes after it. I agree. I, I do wholeheartedly agree. When I was reading some of the exercises that you suggest in the book, whether it's writing down goals just repeatedly, mm -hmm. I understand the value in that so much more now because I've started in little small ways. Yeah. And I think, like you said, just reminding yourself every day of what you're working towards mm -hmm. can be really beneficial just on a subconscious level. Absolutely. So you, you feel like you're accomplishing it already. Yeah. Kind of. Totally. Well, and I think too, just, um, 
even for a lot of women, it's hard to claim their goals. Like you'll say, you know, do you have a dream in your heart, whatever? And they can't even speak it out loud. Sometimes they can't even admit it to themselves. So the just the audacity of writing it down, and I don't just write down my goals. I write them down as if they've already happened. So I wrote for years. I travel a ton for work. So for years I wrote down, I only fly first class. And I wrote that down while I was sitting in a center seat on Southwest. Um, and I just, I, I only fly first class. I only, because I just wanted the reminder of where I'm going. And when you're having a hard time and you're like, what is all this for? And you can look back at those, you're like, this is where we're headed. This is where we're headed. And the crazy thing, I swear, if you look at my journals from five years ago and six years ago, I am living the life right now that I was writing down then. And it's not like magic. It didn't just, you know, it. well, you wrote it down and then the universe was like, here you go. It was because every morning I set the intention of what mattered. So, you know, talk about productivity and what do we want to do with our day. If you guys are like me, you've got you know, a million different responsibilities that you have to hit. And your to-do list is 97 things long. But if you can just start with what matters most, where am I going and what do I need to show up for every morning, then other things suddenly kind of fall to the wayside. You're just like, that would be great to have, but it's not essential and it's not getting me anywhere closer to what I want to create. Definitely. And I think it's um, important to point out in the book that you said, but you also have to ask for help. Yes. Which I think is the hardest thing for a lot of women, a lot of mothers to do because totally. it to them signals weakness. But you kind of point out that it's just you being smart. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, it's like, I don't know if it's weakness so much as what we're mostly shown in media and movies and magazines is the woman who has it all and the people who just handle it all by themselves. And it drives me batty because that is not reality. Um, it, to operate at a certain level, like the, the biggest executives in the world have an entire staff of people who help them function. The celebrities that you admire have assistants, have trainers, have chefs, they have so much. But rarely do people, especially women in positions of power, say what it takes to get to this level. And I think the reason they don't is they know it's the thing they're going to be attacked on most. So uh, in this book, I like gave people ammunition. I mean, like the last book people, I, here's the thing, the last book people attacked me for stuff I never anticipated would upset them. Yeah. So this time I was like, here you go. Like, <laughs> here's all the things. Go ahead. Because I, it, there are definitely people who will read that I have a nanny or that I have a full-time housekeeper and will get pissed because I've experienced it before. They're going to be like, oh, it must be nice to eat bonbons all day while someone else raises your children. I'm like, you know what, Pam? You don't know anything. You know uh, what, Sharon? <laughs> I know. Calm down. <laughs> um, but really... It doesn't matter who it upsets. It matters more if a handful of women see that information and feel like, oh, that's how. And they raise their hand and ask for help. And the thing was, I'm at a place in my career where I can afford that. And I know not every woman can. And that's essential to pay attention to because that matters but there was a time in my life where I traded with other moms. Hey, I need two hours on Saturday, and I'll trade you two hours on Saturday. I'll watch your kids if you will watch my kids and we can trade. Or I'm going to ask my mother-in-law, or I'm going to ask my mom, or I don't know. I'm going to ask the partner who helped me create these babies and remind him that they're his children, too. And he can show, you know, like, so it's so ridiculous how often we are afraid. I just realized he's in the back of the room. Hi, honey. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, honey. I thought you were in the other room and you couldn't hear me talking <laughs> trash. Um, no, but it's it's crazy to me how um, how afraid women are to. It's not even a lack of help most of the time. They won't accept help when it's offered. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to a gal yesterday who was like, "Man, my mom lives next door. Like she lives next door and she's constantly asking if she can help with the baby." And I'm like, "I've got it," because she wants to prove that she can do it all. But there's a reason why you know women come up to me at book signings and they're like. I've lost myself. I've lost myself. And it's because they're pouring themselves out to everybody else. There's nothing left. The tank is empty. It's why, you know, the, you've got to take care of yourself or you're not going to be able to show up for anybody else. Yeah, and I think this culture that we live in now with social media obviously heightens it. I have a lot of friends who are mothers for the first time. And a lot of friends who, they come to me. I'm single. And they vent to me. And I'm like, 
you should talk to so-and-so. She's going through the same thing. And I can listen, but she might actually be able to give you advice for how she's surviving it. But it's almost like women don't want to talk to each other because they don't want to show that they're not super women. Of course. I mean, we all do this, yeah. right? Like we're all, it's like we're all perpetually stuck in seventh grade and we're trying to prove to the other girls that we're cool too. And we've got it all together and our hair looks great. And it's, you know, like w I get it. I get it because it is, it, it's ingrained in us from a very young age, but it's going to take raising your hand and telling people that you need help. It's going to take more women in positions of uh, women who have power women who have platforms to say this is what it looks like to show here I am without makeup to tell you these are extensions these are extensions these are extensions like to, to to talk about what it is because I think when we're in like LA or New York like you get it you know that's a filter you know that they made her they photoshopped her to look that way the problem is not those women the problem is the mom in Minneapolis. The problem is the, the college grad in Iowa who doesn't understand that this is not real life. It doesn't register to her that you're showing a highlight reel. And so she keeps thinking that she's got to be a certain way because she doesn't have enough women in her life who are like, oh, girl, here's, here's where we're really at. Uh, so, you know, I just feel like every single time, um, this happens a lot, like in business, you know, that old saying, fake it till you make it. I hate that expression. I hate it because I think the only time you should fake anything is confidence because I think if you fake confidence, you will eventually feel confident. But everything else, when you fake it, you are alienating yourself from the community that could actually help you. You are alienating yourself from the resources and the knowledge that could make you stronger and could take away these insecurities. If only you had the courage to raise your hand and say, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's such good advice. Yeah. And I wish more women would just stop being so hard on themselves, stop apologizing, yes. and just share with each other. Yeah. It's so important. Also, I want to point out in the book, there's a mom spaghetti joke. I totally got Thank it. You. I laughed out loud. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, no one's going to get this yeah. Eminem reference, I but I appreciate you. that I you, you do. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the audience really quick before we get out of here. Yeah. We have two questions. Who do we have first? Right here. You're so stinking funny. Oh, I thanks. love how funny you are. Um, I find you to be an incredible blend of, like, you're credible and you're vulnerable, those two. And then now in this book, you're super tactical, which I love. Good. So the milestones, like the, the, you have your goals, you have your yeah. milestones. And I'll say, I don't think I was ready to admit trying to go for partner at my firm until I started kind of reading your content. So yeah. you're really changing stuff. That's so um, rad. Thank you for it saying is, that. It is rad. <laughs> um, thank you. How granular do you get? I'm assuming you've got spreadsheets on these things because from your personality. Yeah. What, how granular <laughs> do you get on these and the milestone setting. And do you share it with people? I would say not just like your mentors work wise, but would mm -hmm. you share it with like your spiritual folks, like your mentors there? How open are you and how malleable is it? Or do you just know? Um, so, so what she's talking about is in the book, I say that you start with the goal, like you start with the end goal and you sort of work backwards from there and you give yourself these mile markers along the way. Like what are the things that break up in between where you are and where you want to be? Honestly, that journey for me has always been very personal. So I don't tend to, it's it probably a therapist would have a field day with this, but I don't tend tend to share my goals with other people. I don't tend to talk about something until it's done because for me, it's really powerful to, um, there's something mentally to me that's very powerful about being like, when this gets done, I'll be able to stick my flag in the ground and say that I accomplished this thing because I think there are so many people on social who are claiming something they haven't yet achieved. They're like, it's the first day of marathon training. And I'm like, you haven't run any miles yet. Like I, that's probably obnoxious, but for me, it's a, it's a really personal thing. Um, and then in terms of how, like how granular do I get as much as I need to, it, to me, like it's about motivating myself to go to the next step. Because when I was younger in my career, I would think, I don't know where to go from here. Like, I have no idea how to get a literary agent. And so I would just keep backing up and backing up and backing up and making that elephant smaller and smaller and smaller until this was finally a bite I could take, until I could finally do this, this thing. Does that make sense? Does, yeah. Is there something specifically in your career that you feel like you are struggling with how to make it or how to get the support that you need? I think I'm struggling with being both like at a firm in New York and being a Christian and a mom, all mm -hmm. these things mixed together yeah. and just wanting to know, um, I, I do believe in vulnerability, yeah. but I also know how hard it is to make at, at my particular firm to make partner. Yeah. So how, um, 
beyond my own sort of sense of what I think is true, yeah. how, how open shall I be to get input into like a feedback loop going in case that adjusts the milestone? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So I feel like when it comes to something like that, when it comes to you're in a corporation, you're working with other people, that feedback can be incredible because it could be something as simple as other people not even being aware of what it is that you want right, for right. yourself and asking for that feedback has someone showing up and going, oh gosh, okay. Or maybe even just seeing you in a way that they haven't before. Hey, this is something that she's really aiming for. Like, this is my goal. Tell me how to get there. I know in leading my own team, when a woman on, well, I mean, or a man, but especially when the women on our team say, I want to own a home. Yeah. Like, this is my goal. I want to own a home. And so I'm like, okay, great. Well, just here's my perspective. We might need to get you into a role that's more sales and bonus oriented. So you've got, but it helps me as their leader set them up for that success. That. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. That's Thank it. you. I love that. That's actually, I have a lot of um, like interns and college kids who will ask me for advice now. And that's what I tell them. I'm like, just make sure people know what you want. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. yeah. Make sure you know what you want, right? right? Yeah. Well, first. Yeah, yeah. no, that's But good. at work, it's like, you don't have to be crazy, but like people should know what your goals are. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. You have personal goals, but career-wise. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Next question. Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you for all the content you put out. I really appreciate it. It's helped mold my life into a better direction, so I'm really grateful. Thank you. But um, I have a question. I know you talk a lot about being told negativity, uh, especially online and things mm -hmm. like that. I read your first book. I'm in the process of reading your second book here. Not your first book, but your... Yeah, you know, yes. the last one. Yeah. So I am trying to figure out... I get a lot of really mean things just said to my face by work colleagues or like things that are just really uncalled for. Um, and I don't know, I take things so hard and I don't want to, and I know it's not supposed to be in my business, you know, what their perspective, what they're thinking, whatever, but it's hard to separate that. And I'm wondering, how do you handle that when, I mean, it just devastates me. Um, well, where are you working? I mean, you so, don't have to yeah. say the name. No, no, no. But I like, need to talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm a violinist. So I do movie soundtracks. Yeah. I do um, um, Broadway and I do ballet and I do all sorts of like things that are, you can't, address the situation mm. because then you won't be called on to work wow. for certain places. So you have to let it yes. just go. That sucks. But I but also yeah. have to pretend like I'll take that comment, but what they said was really awful. Yeah. You know? And so how do you just navigate through that? So, I mean, the, the thing I wish I could say is just like, screw that, you know, go do something else. But I understand that that's not as easy. Um, it, it sucks that in the entertainment industry or in the in the positions that you find yourself in that this is the narrative. So I was an assistant in the entertainment industry and if uh, the things I could tell you that have been screamed at me in my life and unfortunately at the time it was like if you want a job, this is what you will take, mm -hmm. which is awful. Um, so uh, I mean like what I want to tell you is like by allowing that, by accepting that and allowing that and like is this a conversation within the environment that you're in or with other people who are musicians or to stand up against this because it's not okay it's like this is where the me too movement became such a huge thing was that one woman raised her hand and said it's not okay and then someone else was like oh my gosh this happened to me and then so many of us were like this has happened to me and until someone stands up and says that there there's a big difference between someone being mean to me on Instagram about my hair and you having to work in a hostile work environment and it being allowed to be okay right. and so the the thing that I would say is um, I'm like form a union talk to each other like get, have a meet like hey this uh, I'm sure that there are certain I'm gonna say conductors because I don't know who would be saying these comments but I'm sure there are certain people who are worse than others in your industry um I mean does that like me saying that you're like oh no that's not a yeah, I yeah. Mean, there's, there's just some things you can't it's just sort of like you'll let it sit and it's actually and as you have found this in your career it's mostly women yeah and um it's just really mean. It just I don't know how to like you. And also they're like, well, we control your destiny, kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, we'll keep you down if we need to. So it's so take it. Are you like, in your dream job? Um, no, you're not because not if you quite. have to say oh, no, you're not. No. So there's a like there's a lot of ways to pay your bills. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to pay your bills, and 
my gut says if if you're in an environment that is this hostile and this ugly, this will eat you alive. It's already eating you alive, right? I've already I've created plan to like work out of this yes. with my husband. Like yes. it's almost like I might change my entire career, which is weird because I've done this since I was eight. You go to Juilliard, it's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But maybe not. You yeah. Know? And it's but there are lots of ways to do your gift, right? There's lots of ways to share your gift with the world. There's lots of ways for you to be creative and express yourself as an artist. Have you ever read Big Magic? No. Oh, my gosh. Go get that today. Big okay. Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, where she talks about the power of doing the thing you love without attaching money to it. Okay. Because if you're able to do something else and do this thing that you love, then you just get to express yourself and have the freedom of being a musician without having to deal with people who are jerks. Yeah. Um, it's like, look, you, you know, you can either change the things you can't accept or you need to move on to something else. Life is too short. Life is too short. What if you've got six months left and you don't know it? What if that were true? What if today was all you had and you continue to put yourself in an environment where you are getting beat up and oppressed and it's, it's tearing you apart? It's tearing you apart. I can't imagine the anxiety I would have of having to walk into an environment like that every day and trying to do this thing that you love and that you've loved since you were little. And are you starting to hate it? Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Because when other people start to beat you up, I know, I know that's emotional. I know that's emotional. They're, don't let them kill this part of you. And they will. You'll start to hate the music. And it's not the music's fault. It's other people. So find a way to get to be your creative, beautiful self, to get to be the artist that you are, and find some other way to pay the bills. Okay. You Thank deserve you. that. You're welcome. That was really great advice, really powerful advice. And I think we're all rooting for you. And we all have been in your shoes before. And so I think this was a really helpful conversation, not just for you, but for everybody listening and watching. And so if you want more of this amazing sage advice, <laughs> uh, make sure you guys go pick up Girl Stop Apologizing. It's available now wherever books are sold. Give it up for Rachel Hollis. Guys.